perhaps the most memorable encounter I've had with anyone. You know, the one thing about being an e-commerce store and being sort of, you know, if you put up an e-commerce, you're global from day one. You can have customers coming in from anywhere. It's always easy to lose track. Sometimes one of the big questions we get from customers is like, what laws do I have to apply to? And what laws do I do affect me? And really to know that, we have to look at where your traffic's coming from and where your customers are buying from to really understand. And that's where you need something to help you figure that out. Welcome to the Own Your Commerce podcast, where leading experts, brands, and innovators reveal strategies for e-commerce growth. I'm your host, Jay Myers, and this show is brought to you by Bold Commerce. It seems like every day there's some new compliance as an e-commerce store that you have to keep up with, whether that's updating your privacy policy, updating your cookie policy, are you GDPR compliant, CCPA compliant? The list goes on. Uh, it seems overwhelming, but our guest today is the CEO of a company called Inzuzo, and this is what they do. They specialize in helping brands make sure that they are complying in all the privacy laws now and the ones that are coming down the pipe. And while it may not be you know, the sexiest thing to talk about, it's critical that you get this right. It's actually not very hard. A lot of people want to look the other way and, and kind of avoid the problem. Um, but understanding it, understanding what the regulations are and how to meet them is critical to making sure that you, well, quite frankly, don't get in trouble and that you're giving your customers the best experience and treating their data properly. So it's a, it's a great episode. I think one that everyone really should listen to, to make sure that you're up to speed on a lot of these topics. Let's, uh, let's dive into it. I've got the CEO, Matei of Inzuzo here with me. Let's go. Matei, it's so good having you here. Thank you so much for coming on, on the show. Can you give us a quick introduction? Who are you and what is, how do you pronounce it? Inzuzo? Inzuzo, it means uh, privacy. So that's Oh, it, in what language? In the Igbo language. So it's an African language uh, based in Nigeria. Awesome. Yeah. So give us, okay, give us a little bit on your background and what is Inzuzo? Okay, my background is um, I've been an entrepreneur for many years. Uh, this is my third company that I've started in all kinds of different areas. But for the first time, I am jumped into e-commerce. Um, I think it's a super exciting space. I'm really excited about it. But I've been in the tech space basically for, for my entire career. And one of the reasons I decided to start in Suso is I was speaking to a lot of my entrepreneur friends and uh, there was just a common sort of theme about people being concerned about data privacy, not really knowing what they needed to do. I think most people I talk to care. They want to do the right thing, but they're, it's so complicated that they don't know what to do. So I thought this would be a great great opportunity to start a company to really demystify and simplify data privacy and make it easy for merchants. Yeah, it's uh, merchants want to focus on their business, making money, marketing, getting traffic. And then in the last few years, they've had all these data privacy like laws and regulations thrown at them that they've had to scramble and figure out. So essentially that's when, when did you found it? Is that when you came to the picture when kind of like the GDPR wave was a few years ago? Yeah. Two years ago, we found it. It was a little bit after as the GDPR wave had already gotten, but just before the CCPA wave that's come in since. And we're kind of looking at, it, there was a wave already in larger enterprises, but we noticed it hadn't really hit smaller businesses as much. And so we saw the opportunity there. Okay, so just for a bit of background, I think most of our audience will know these terms, but I always, acronyms are always, I like to clarify. So GDPR, CCPA, can you give us the quick Coles notes on what they are and why they matter? Yeah, so GDPR is a European law covering all of Europe and of course the UK as well. And it's the General Data Protection Regulation. And basically, it's a very broad law that basically says consumers, your customers, have the right it's their data. They have the right to control their data. So if they want to ask you to delete their data, to change it, to get access to what you have on them, to have transparency on what you do with their data, do you sell it? How do you store it? Is it secure? Any of that stuff, they're in control and you have to comply. And probably the big thing about GDPR was that it actually has teeth. There is actually an enforcement body that hands out fines and there's also lawsuits and you can, they can go and, and be applied against it. And it really has teeth. And so that's why everybody has to care uh, whether, you know, some people care because they care. Other people, you want to protect their business and, and the risks of fines. And so that's really was a game changer. Everybody kind of had to 
really pay attention. And CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act, was essentially came in after and it was um, kind of modeled after GDPR. It's not quite as comprehensive as GDPR, but it's got a lot of the common elements, the the elements of consumers having control. There are some thresholds. You have to have so many customers in in California and so much revenue before it applies to you. But you know, the one thing about being an e-commerce store and being sort of, you know, if you put up an e-commerce, you're global from day one. You can have customers coming in from anywhere. It's always easy to lose track. Sometimes one of the big questions we get from customers is like, what laws do I have to apply to? And what laws do I do affect me? And really to know that, we have to look at where your traffic's coming from and where your customers are buying from to really, and how much they're buying to really understand. And that's and that's where you need something that to help you figure that out. So, and that can be changing at any given time. So a lot of times just GDPR is the most comprehensive law. So when you're compliant with that, you're more than likely going to be in good shape for all the other ones. But you do have to pay attention to because the other laws have some specific things that are slightly different as well. So. So if you are in North America, you mentioned GDPR is mostly European. If you're only selling within North America, do they need to be concerned with GDPR? Yeah. So there's still some ways of if you have European visitors to your website, but you know, even if they're not buying anything, you still have to be a little bit careful about that. That can still impact you. However, if you're only selling and part of it is, let's say somebody goes and fills out a shopping cart and then figures out, oh, you don't ship to my country, say it's in Germany. A lot of uh, CRMs will still collect that personal information from an abandoned shopping cart and put it, and now you own data from a European, even though they didn't buy anything. And maybe they got on your mailing list, and then all of a sudden they're going to expect to assert their GDPR rights, right? So that's an example where it still impacts you, even though you don't sell. And of course, then if you're in North America, then laws like CCPA will impact you more, but it doesn't mean you can ignore GDPR. Right. So what are some of the ways that, you know, you mentioned GDPR actually has teeth. What are some of the ways that brands are getting caught, if you will? Like what are, I imagine there's instances where people think they're GDPR compliant or they, they maybe pay a little bit of attention to it, but not enough. Or are the cases you've seen that, the ones that have been fined are just completely ignoring it? Or do you see a bit of both? That's a great question. So I think the big public stories you'll see around uh, data breaches and a data breach can happen to anybody. It can happen to say a platform like Shopify, it can happen to an individual merchant. It can happen, let's say to your, your Klaviyo account or something like that. A- anyone can experience it. And usually when there are data breaches, then a bunch of stuff gets found out that shouldn't have been happening. So if you if you're non-compliant to data privacy law and there's a data breach, that that's where a lot of stuff gets exposed. But then how that data breach is handled as well. And that's where you'll see those multi-million, even sometimes multi-hundred million dollar fines and lawsuits that will happen. Now, that's a little bit less of an occurrence for, say, a smaller to mid-sized merchant that it can happen, but it's one of those like black swan events. And, you know, to protect yourself against those things is generally what you want to do is you want to be doing following the best practices around data privacy, because generally what tends to happen is when there's a big event like that, the regulars will go out and the lawsuits will go out after people that were doing the least or or obvious targets they want to make examples of a lot of times. If you're sort of following best practices and you're doing everything you possibly can, nobody can prevent a data breach. If somebody wants to get in, they, they get in. But if you're following the best practices, then you're more likely than not to be in good shape. Now, the other types of uh, sort of fine is, let's say it could be a complaint based. So let's say a, a customer comes on your site and you know you put them on your mailing list. We see this all the time. You have customers that come in and they want to get off the mailing list. Merchants will make it easy. So they, they submit a GDPR delete request, which is basically delete all my data. You have to actually fulfill those within a certain period of time. So under GDPR, it's 30 days. Under CCPA, it's 45 days. If you don't do that, they can report you. And we've seen fines of, you know, between uh, two and 20,000 euros. So between 2,000, 20,000 euros per instance for companies to just ignore those, right? And that's a different type of risk where you need to have kind of the tools and systems in place. Most companies say you have a, a privacy policy and then you put an email address on that privacy policy service for privacy at merchant.com. 
But is anybody checking that email address? Uh, sometimes we found those email addresses are sometimes dead. Uh, or are you, you know, looking at those requests and actually servicing them in the right amount of time? And the other bit is sometimes merchants don't even have a privacy policy, don't even have contact information. And then you can get into even more trouble with that kind of approach. So those are, those are just some of the more common types of situations. A fairly prominent case just recently, a company called Minted.com that actually had a banner on their front page saying, hey, we just settled the $5 million class action CCPA suit. And it ended up being something like you know $50 per customer or something like that. It was a big thing over their violation. That was the first CCPA related big fine. That was, that was actually a lawsuit that was settled. And they had, you know, our kind of view of it is, hey, better to have a cookie banner on your site than a, I just settled the lawsuit banner. <laughs> because that's, that's what they had. And, and they had, because they had to get the information to, to all their customers. So that was the way to do it. And of course, that's just like really terrible for your brand if you have that on your website. So obviously, I mean, the, the email address is being collected and used in inappropriate ways is, is the obvious example. But I know at Bold, when we went through to become GDPR compliant, we had to look at a lot of the third party software we use as well, too. And I think this is something that I think a lot of merchants don't think about. So maybe they are handling data the right way. They're not emailing customers they shouldn't. They're not storing their emails. One that actually came up, and I don't know if they're, I think they might be compliant now, but so Grammarly is a, is a browser plugin that helps you write <laughs> with proper grammar and millions of people use it. We actually, I haven't checked recently, but like a year and a half ago, our security team told us we weren't, we weren't allowed to have that browser plugin because in their terms, it says they store the actual copy from anything you use. A lot of people use note taking apps, you know, when they're on a, a Zoom call or Google Meet call, it's recording even things like the software we're using to record this podcast has to be has to be compliant as well too to an extent if you're sharing data in it and that's something that a lot of brands i think they don't think they think and that's how can you get into trouble there how many layers deep do brands need to think about yeah no, that's a great question so essentially under gdpr which of course is the most comprehensive law there's this concept of data controller and data processor so a merchant is a data controller meaning you have the ultimate responsibility like the buck stops with you for data that you collect when you subcontract out data processing or, or storage to let's say either a shopify or a wix or a clavio or you know some other app or aws whatever that is those are data processors and they have some responsibility on themselves as well, but they don't have as much as you. You have more as a data controller. So it is your responsibility as a merchant slash data controller to, for everything that touches your customer's data, to evaluate it, to look at both the privacy and security risks around it and have a policy and have policies and, and sort of processes in place to make sure that that data gets handled really well. So in, let's say, larger companies, Bold Commerce is a great example. You would have a dedicated security privacy team. And what they would most likely do is they would have these um, surveys. They would Every company that handles uh, Bold Commerce data would get this privacy security survey they would have to fill out. And then that person who's dedicated, that's their job. They would look at all of you know how they answered their, that survey and they would decide, okay, I can trust this company with our customer data or I cannot. The example you mentioned is there was one company, Grammarly, that was decided, okay, we can't trust this company. You have to look at the company's own. Of course, you start with looking at their privacy policy and in terms of use and things like that. But you're also going to ask them questions about how they store your customer data. Now, when we get into the e-commerce space and let's say you have a, a merchant that's on Shopify and they start installing all kinds of apps, most people don't do this level of due diligence. Most people don't look at apps. But... The reality is you, any app you install has access to a lot, if not all of your customer data, and that's going to be a weak link. Now, that app itself will have share some responsibility if you know something happens. However, that doesn't mean you're absolved. In fact, you have more responsibility as a, as a data controller or merchant. And so that's where it's really important to, if you want to be trustworthy yourself, you have to basically do business with trustworthy people and evaluate that. Yeah, it's such a, it's an amazing web when you actually go down and see where all data can possibly go. 
I was just thinking back and I know there was actually a couple email apps that we weren't allowed to use at Bold that had send later functionality. So, which is, it seems like a simple, innocent thing. I think one was Spark and actually Superhuman, which is a really common one that a lot of, a lot of startups <laughs> use. And it's, I know a ton of people that use it, but it, I think they've since changed this, but it at the time wasn't GDPR compliant because it stored the email on their servers and then would send it the next day or whenever he schedules to be sent. And they didn't have, this was early on. So it's, it's definitely an interesting exercise to go through and see where data actually, all the properties it touches. So then, okay, so how do you engage with brands at Inzuzo? You have software, do you consult with them? It maybe explain where Inzuzo comes into the picture. Absolutely. So we have the number one gap we saw when we entered the market was education. Just these privacy laws are fairly complex and distilling things down, what do you need to do as a merchant? So one of the first things we started doing is generating a lot of content on our website and, and suzo.com. So that's E-N-Z-U-Z-O.com or for our American friends, E-N-Z-U-Z-O.com. And we have a lot of, so, you know, one of the first pieces of content we had out there was the the privacy playbook. Here are the top 10 things as a merchant you need to worry about data privacy and just really distills it down for you what you need to think about. We also have an app, your Shopify app, as well as kind of a platform agnostic app on our website that you can install and gives you auto-generated privacy policies, cookie consent banners, and a lot of other capabilities to manage the data privacy workflow, such as when you get deletion requests, we can automate all of that. And the combination of content and sort of an easy to use app that's really made for merchants, the idea is we demystify a lot of, okay, what does this all mean? I don't even know where to start to, okay, here's the top five things you need to think about. And here's some tools to actually help you actually do that. That really helps kind of get a merchant from, I don't know what I'm doing to, okay, I actually have some, I'm following some best practices. Now we can't solve all data privacy problems, but we do a pretty good job of kind of getting you really good basics in place. And then as your business evolves and as you, your data collection practices get more sophisticated, then we work with merchants to sort of, you know, either evolve or product, or sometimes we provide advice and consultation if people have questions. We're like super responsive on our our, our chat about you know anybody that has any questions. Um, like a great example of a question that came to us just recently was a merchant was trying to install a Google Merchant product, and Google was blocking them because they did not have the right privacy policy on their website. So actually, it was interesting because Google actually is starting to enforce you know you don't have the right privacy basics on your on your store, they won't let you even use their tools. That's not like a relatively new thing. So they needed our help how to configure their privacy tools to make sure that Google could would do business with them. So that's an example of something. And, and you know, we'll, we'll then help that merchant configure their site. And of course, they were off to the races within a few minutes. That's basically what we do. We're privacy experts, but we're trying to make it simple and automated and self-serve. So you don't need a lawyer. And you don't need an expensive consultant. We're trying to make everything super accessible and whatever as much as possible in the merchant's hands. To really help e-commerce brands get like the fundamentals right, it sounds like. Yeah, the fundamentals, exactly. Yeah. I wanted to touch on, you said, okay, there's a few things I want to dive into, but one was you automate data requests. Did I hear that right? Exactly. How does that work? So let's say if somebody is using one of our own auto-generated privacy policies, you know, like... For example, Shopify has a privacy policy, the template that you can copy. Some people actually copy it and paste it word for word with the insert here, template still here, which is really, really bad, by the way. That's like, you should not do that. Uh, You're going to get fined if you do that. So we actually have a privacy policy that you fill out a questionnaire, you tell us something about your business, and we actually generate like lawyer legal reviewed language that's proper and really well thought out, properly done. And within that privacy policy, there is a form uh, for requesting your data. That's all baked in. And so when a customer goes on your privacy policy, they go, oh, I want to request, you know, either find out what data you have or just delete my data. We basically have a form that first authenticates that user. So first of all, we figure out if this is this a real person, is there a user, do they actually, uh, can they authenticate by email or potentially 2FA? And then if they're authenticated, we then, it's kind of, we create a ticket 
within our, our app for the merchant. And we notify the merchant. We say, okay, this customer wants to delete all their data. First of all, we'll tell you, did we, what do we find? What data do we have on this customer? Okay, here it is. And would you like to approve the deletion? And then all the merchant has to do is say, yep, I approve. And then we go and handle everything else. We'll delete their data out of um, the CRM. And then we send a notification to the user saying, we've done all this compliant to GDPR. And we tell you, for example, we tell the merchant, okay, this person submitted this five days ago. You have 25 days under GDPR left to complete this request because after 30 days is your time. So make sure you do it in the right amount of time. So are you integrated with specific CRMs to automate that? or? Yeah, so right now we're integrated with Shopify and we're going to be adding other integrations as well. And so is the goal, actually, you know what? Well, I ask it now. I have some questions around like what the future holds for Inzuzo, but I imagine the goal is to eventually have the ability to automate that across anywhere that data is stored or is it just, just CRM? The goal is ultimately to automate that everywhere. Right now, we have a combination of, of automated and, and manual. So let's say if all your customer data is in Shopify, we can do that all automatically. However, if somebody has a combination of other tools and whatever, we still do the automation, but it's more the actual deletion part that has to be done manually, but we still automate the process and the workflow. So you still want to keep track of the request, make sure you, you completed it within a certain period of time, depending on where the customer is. So, you know, if they're a California customer, you have 45 days. If they're a German customer, you have 30 days. So knowing all those things, we just kind of handle all that. There's still a lot of value. And then the other piece is you need to store that request somewhere so that if someone says, well, I asked you to leave my data, but you didn't, you want to be able to prove it in case this gets challenged in court, but you want to store it in somewhere where it's like really safe and it's not going to then cause another data privacy issue. So we kind of handle that in a, in a very specific way in terms of, you know, we can generate compliance reporting that doesn't have any personal information in it. So you can prove you, you kind of service the request without having any personal information in, in that report. Gotcha. There's still going to be some like work required from the brand. I mean, if I, if you automatically delete it in Shopify, but if that store has done an export and has a CSV sitting on their hard drive, with all the customers, they're still in trouble, correct? And Zuzu can only do so much. There is some responsibility on the merchant's side. Absolutely. And and we're trying to move everyone to a place where everything's kind of what we called, we call structured data and it's automated. So, you know, structured data, it's like your customer's data say in Shopify or in Klaviyo, but unstructured data would be if it's in a Google Doc or something you know, on a spreadsheet or, or it's written down on a piece of paper somewhere, you don't want to, this is like number one thing if everyone can do, don't store your customer data in unstructured formats, you know, like a Google Doc, a spreadsheet or wherever, have it in a dedicated, either a CRM, a dedicated tool that has the right sort of privacy hooks in it. Because then there'll be people like us that will then automate it and keep track of all of that. People who put customer data in, you know, things like Google Docs that I've seen in larger enterprises, they'll then go and spend a lot of money on data scanning and AI and categorization tools to go and find it. And it just becomes a huge mess. Um, and so avoid that. Just treat your customer data really like you have to start thinking about customer data like money. Uh, you wouldn't just leave money around. You put it in a bank. You put it in very specific places and you take care of it. You don't just leave it around anywhere. Yeah, that's important. And what constitutes, at what point is it money? Is it when there's an email attached to it or is it just a first name and last name? If someone's listening and they have like exported some data from whatever their e-commerce platform, if they have just a list of maybe names and a state or na uh, f first name and maybe order revenue amount is that data or does it need to have a certain amount of information about a person to be trouble like <laughs> it's a great question and we get this question a lot and i think the important thing to understand is that the data privacy laws are really really broad to the point where even an ip address which is like the internet address of your computer which is just a number on the internet can be considered pii if somehow somebody can use that to identify an individual person Right. So it's personally identifiable information. Yeah, exactly. So it's not about asking which piece of data is considered. It's, it's about anything that can be used to trace back to a person is considered PII or personally identifiable information. So really, when you're thinking about it, the way you want to think about it is the least 
you want to have just like absolutely nothing related to a customer in, in those unstructured, unsaved data formats. Because uh, you never know what two, three pieces of information can be put together and then you triangulate an identity. Um, yeah. It's very eye-opening when you deal with someone that really understands the importance of this. And like, if I ever have to email anyone on our team and if there's anything, I mean, you sometimes legitimately have to share data between, it could be software, different things. And, and our security team will be on top of it like that. Like, can this, can this file be deleted now? Can this be removed? Can this, like, they don't want anything hanging around. It's exactly like that. Like having money, just like, it's a really good way to think about it. You know, one of the things I wanted to talk about was zero party data versus first party data and the difference and maybe how, what the impact of that to merchants are. Yeah, that's a great question. So this is something that has been a huge, huge shift in, in e-commerce in the last uh, few months, although it's been kind of telegraphed about a year ago when kind of Apple and Google has followed it when they announced that they're changing the rules of data collection on, on smartphones. And it's now been implemented with both iOS and Android, where it used to be there was a ton of personal data collected from apps, iOS and Android apps that ultimately would help, it, that stuff would trickle into Google and Facebook and all kinds of other places and would help with things like finding customers through ads, Facebook ads, Google ads, and, and that ultimately helped merchants pop up a store and, and get customer acquisition really, really fast and in some cases really, really cheap. So a lot of the early days of e-commerce growth, that's, those are really important tools. What's happened is Apple and both Google decided we're turning off some of those tabs. Now, not all the tabs are turned off, but for example, the data, personal data collection on apps has gone from default opt-out to default opt-in. What, what that means is that now an app user has to explicitly say they want to share data with an app. By default, they're not sharing it. And, and the, I believe I've read that the default opt-in rate is like 4%. It used to be 100%. So basically, you lost most, like 96% of that data you've lost. The knock-on effect of that has been that ad attribution from merchants has really gotten impacted. And so the cost effectiveness of, of Google Ads and Facebook Ads, that's just becoming a lot less compelling, as, especially as a primary way of customer acquisition. And in parallel to all of that, you've got this dynamic that there is an e-commerce model on Amazon where you don't necessarily need those that data, but then you've, you're at risk of being Amazon basic and it's hard to build a brand there. So if you're not going down that path and you're building your own brand, the trend is personalization and, and kind of you want to personalize the brand. But in order to personalize, you need customer data. So this is the old merchants are now between a rock and a hard place because you know, very, very large e-commerce companies, let's say someone like Adidas, they already have a ton of customer data. So they're in a great spot because they understand the market, they understand customers, they can just leverage. In this new world, they, they have enough data they can leverage. But if you're a small or emerging brand and you haven't had a chance to amass uh, yourselves data from a customer, then getting that data has become way harder. And the data you get directly from your customer, from your own store, that's called zero-party data. Um, that's it's direct. The data that you would have access to through a Google or a Facebook, that's third-party data. So what's happened now is third-party data is becoming a lot more expensive, a lot harder to access because of data privacy laws. And so merchants are having to focus on collecting more zero-party data. But one of the challenges there is you have to convince your customer or prospective customers to give you data, but, what, but they may not trust you. And I have one report that came out very recently. It was a great article written that said that, you know, 57% of the e-commerce shoppers would rather protect their data privacy than have a personalized e-commerce experience. So, you know, slightly more than the majority of online commerce would, would want to take the data privacy trade-off. So the, now there's an onus on merchants to provide more of a trusted experience for customers in order to get trust and get more of the data so they can provide that personalization and grow their business. That's, I think, becoming much, much more important. And you're just going to see more and more of that because there's more of these data privacy laws coming into effect. The data collection practices are going to get even more strict. And then the pain points around how do you collect zero-party data, that's going to become more and more important. So 
Well, and I guess it's going to be more critical. I mean, we've always said to have direct communication with your customers to own that relationship versus going through Facebook or Instagram or Google or whoever you're advertising is to actually own the relationship. It actually just makes email, SMS and whatever way you're legitimately communicating with them even more critical. If you were starting a D2C brand right now, what are some things that you have like a kind of a checklist of a few key things that you need to make sure you have in order to kind of set yourself up for at least for success? Absolutely. So the basic sort of, I call it the data privacy front end, which is um, what Google TrustRank looks at every website and looks at, do they have a privacy policy? Do they have a terms of service? I believe they look at, do you have a contact us, contact us page and then a cookie, a cookie banner? So those are the real, real basics of like looking trustworthy, basically. You need those. And for merchants who might be tempted to, let's say, look at a, a Shopify uh, data privacy or terms template and just pop one of those in, unless you're going to have a lawyer or an expert go and actually fill it out for you and properly format it, you don't want to be doing that. You need to use either a professional generator like Zuzo, or you go talk to a lawyer. And of course, it costs a bit of money to have them draft a custom one for you. That's where your terms and your privacy policy, these things matter. And people like Google look at them, but also your, your customers more and more will look at them. And it's just becoming kind of like table stakes. Everybody has one. The big brands all have it. So customers are used to you know seeing that. That's the real basics. What's becoming a basic is also an ability to have the automated data control. Now, where you first started to see the ability for a customer to control their data, to like, let's say, delete their data or, or find out what data exists on them, Apple, Google, Facebook, they all did it first. They all have portals where you can authenticate, say, Apple with your Apple ID, and, and they'll give you like all the data. I, I've actually done this once. I got five gigabytes of data just on me, all the services that I use and everything. But We've recently, we've gone through the top e-commerce brands, and I would say about 30% of the top e-commerce brands have some kind of an automated data privacy request workflow on their site. So examples would be a Skims, Kim Kardashian, if you go look at their site. There's a bunch of other ones, roughly 30%. I think this is going to go to 100% fairly soon. So if you want to kind of like punch above the basics and really look like you're following best practices. That's the one thing you can add. And of course, our our privacy policy gives you both out of the box. We just do that. So those are kind of the basics. And then the the next steps after that would be more looking at your internal data collection, you know, which apps and services do you give access to your data? Do you just look at, you know, without going through a lot of complexity, just take a critical view at those app brands, do they look like trustworthy companies? You know, is there like an office and, you know, is there a LinkedIn page where you can see like real people that are look trustworthy? That's like a good first level. It's not enough to be completely compliant, but that's a good first level. You know, if you, if you download an app, give it access to all your customer data and there's like no trace of that company anywhere, that's usually a pretty bad sign. You can sometimes see, you know, it's like one developer working out of who knows where. So those are some of the considerations that once you get that 1.0 stuff going, you can start thinking a little bit further along. I'm always fascinated about the actual cookie notifications that I, I wanted to ask you because I that's part of your tool, right? Like you can design cookie notifications, you've got some templates. I was browsing around some sites earlier today and I'm just pulling some up here. Like some of them, it's a simple one-liner. Actually, I'm on the um, AWWW awards.com, which is the site has like different examples of websites doing cool things. And anyways, like their cooking notification, which I imagine is legit because they are a legit company, but it's a simple one liner that says this website uses cookies to ensure you get the best experiences on our website. And that's got a link to the cookies policy and then a button that just says, got it. That's it. And then I look at other sites and I, I'm going to pull one up here. It'll be a big thing that takes a third of the page and we store cookies on your computer to collect information about how you interact with our website. This information from these cookies helps us improve our customer experience, show you more relevant, blah, blah, blah. Like to decline this, you can accept your decline. And then you see some that you can manage different cookies. So like enable all, enable some, enable none. Is that just a choice that the brand can make? Or because like it seems to me, why wouldn't you want the shortest 
briefest message possible? Yeah, it's a great question. We get this question all the time. Here's the answer, and it's a little bit complicated, but I'll try and make it as simple as possible. The GDPR is really the only data privacy law today that strictly requires cookies. And there's been some additional you know, laws and court precedents that have even said that you should not be allowed to navigate any of the site until you've actually accepted those cookies. So that to give you kind of that protection that like nothing about you gets captured until you've actually accepted cookies. Now, here's the complexity with this. And then if you're sort of like North American or anywhere else in the world, technically, it's a best practice, but you don't need to have a cookie banner at all. So, so what some companies will do, they'll put a really restrictive page and some of our customers will take our cookie banner and configure it like this. Well, they'll put a really restrictive cookie policy, like where you can't even access the site say for European customers only. But then if anybody else comes along, there'll be no cookie banner. Some customers will decide to do that. But some want a uniform experience for everybody, and that's why you end up seeing some of those things. So we find, you know, you think a cookie banner is a simple tool, but it's actually quite complex because we find we have to look at the IP address of every visitor that's coming into the store, geolocate them, and then potentially display a different cookie banner depending on where they're coming from to give the sort of optimal user experience versus data privacy compliance for that specific country. So that's what you're going to see out there. Now, with all of that, there's another layer of complexity, which is that a lot of like apps and and things that use and generate cookies, they just flat out ignore all the cookie laws, best practices. And so you'll see a lot of merchants will put a very restrictive cookie banner and properly configure and all that, but then they'll have an app that has a cookie that completely ignores that cookie banner. (laughs) So, so like you put a restrictive cookie banner that says you can't browse my site until you accept, but then there's a cookie that gets loaded before that cookie banner, right? And merchants don't actually know sometimes because they don't have the technical expertise to know when that's happening. So some cookie banners will try to act like ad blockers and block their own cookies for apps that the merchant has installed, which is like a really broken way of doing things. So where we've kind of landed on this is we give maximum configurability and we make it easy to use and know, okay, do you want a cookie banner for GDPR and do you want it just for your European customers or do you want to put one that's the same for everybody and then, okay, that's that's great. You can make that choice. It's kind of a, a style choice. But then if there's things you're installing on your website that kind of violate those rules, we're going to go in and give you some information and some some analytics on that, but we're not going to try and control that because that's up to up to the merchant to figure out. And hope, now, over time, I think those things will get cleaned up and Google and Apple are even talking about potentially getting rid of cookies altogether in a few years, but that's going to take a long time to make itself out of the system. Uh, however, right now, it's a bit of a mess, to be honest. And so our recommendation is do the right thing for European customers and put a GPR compliant cookie banner. And then for non-European customers, we still recommend putting something minimalistic that's a best considered a best practice, but not going kind of like, you know, full restrictive mode because you're not required by the law. Yeah. So with Inzuzo, that is a, a feature to be able to geolocate and show different messages or no message by country? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, okay. It's interesting. I just assumed actually... We have it across across the board. Our customers are from all over, but I actually thought even in the US, I thought you still had to have it, but I, that's interesting. I, we've all just, I mean, it seems like we've kind of gotten numb to it. It's the first thing I do when I, you just get on a site and you accept the cookies and away you go. It's kind of, yeah. In the US, it's recommended, but not strictly, strictly necessary. Yeah. I want to ask you two more questions. What What is probably the the biggest mistake you see stores make as you're shopping online and you just want to, and you put your palm to your face and <laughs> when I go, ah, what's the, what's the biggest mistake? Probably the one for us that <laughs> drives us crazy is when people put a non-filled out privacy policy template. Like you copy someone's privacy policy or you copy a template and you clearly don't fill it out and you put it. It's worse. It's better just to not do anything than to do that because that just shows you don't care. And it's actually worse than not having one, which you know, you can say, hey, I just didn't get around to it. But when I do it, I'm going to do it right. That's probably the one that really drives us crazy. And did you mention if you copy a template and you left the template wording in there, you can actually get fined for that? I would say here's, let me be a little bit more specific about that. I think when you do that, it signals that you're being sloppy and it just invites more scrutiny. 
<laughs> and once you're not doing things properly and you invite more scrutiny, the, the odds of a fine increase drastically. That, that's what I would say specifically. So you just don't want to call attention to yourself if you, you know, especially because because that's such a public thing, your privacy policy. Anybody can go and find that. You don't want to call attention to yourself like that. And by the way, it is almost impossible to perfectly be compliant to every data privacy law out there. Like virtually nobody is. So it's, the game is about following, doing as much as you possibly can to follow all the best practices because the laws are so broad that you can't possibly tick 100% of the boxes. And that's where... We try to go, okay, these are the top five things you want to do, and that'll get you in pretty good shape. Are you seeing GDPR trolls out there? Like a little bit, but not as much as something like ADA compliance, uh, because I think Americans are far more litigious than, than, say, Europeans. And there isn't a U.S. federal privacy law right now, but I would expect once that comes into place, which... I think it will because there's a bunch of states putting privacy laws uh, together, like Virginia is a, a recent one, and there's more coming that I think there's pressures building for a federal law to come in because nobody wants to have 50 laws, 50 privacy laws to comply to. And at that point, I think you will start to see more and more of that, of the trolls. It's bound to happen. Yeah. So just before the episode, you let out some exciting news. This is probably people might know about it now from when this uh, goes out, but you just completed a raise. So you're obviously doubling down on the company. Well, for, congratulations, first of all. Yeah, thank you. No, it's great to have our investors have seen us kind of become a leader in this category in e-commerce, data privacy, and, and they see a great opportunity for growth and are backing us. And so we're going to be that's going to allow us to expand our product offering and really deliver more value to, to merchants in terms of data privacy. And our goal is just make data privacy easy, make it simple for merchants. And that's what we're here to do. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's merchants want to focus on making money, not worrying about all of this kind of stuff. So it's a fantastic service. Where can people go to learn more or like, how can they get started? It's a SaaS app. They can just install, correct? Yeah. So it's actually a, a free, a free SaaS app on enzuzo.com, E-N-Z-U-Z-O.com. And then if you are a Shopify merchant, just you can find us on the Shopify app store. Awesome. Well, Matei, thank you so much for coming on the show. I learned a lot. It was a real pleasure having you on. Awesome. It was a great pleasure, Jay, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing this out live. That's it for another episode of Own Your Commerce. If what you've heard has helped you in any way, I'd love it if you'd leave us a review in iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast. It's a new podcast and reviews really help spread the word. And if you know someone you think that might benefit from this podcast, share it with a friend. If you'd like to learn more about Bold, visit boldcommerce.com. You can view all our past episodes. And if you have a story you'd like to tell, we'd love to have you on the show. You can apply to be a guest or suggest a guest on our website as well. That's all for now. And we'll see you next week. 